This is going to change the world as we know it. And it's not going to end uh, in the near future. And for generations to come, this war will be defining in, in terms of how we perceive the Russian society contra the Western world. The pictures that I have been working on uh, in Ukraine over the last year uh, are a documentation of the brutality uh, within the conflict itself. Uh, mainly that it is about, you know, it's about civilians, uh, civilian casualties, because they are the ones who are hit the hardest. And I mean, I spent, uh, by now, I spent more than three months uh, on the front lines in Ukraine during the first year of the war. And for me, looking at all, all this suffering, whether it being children or women or, or men, uh, has completely changed my perception of this conflict. The Russian forces and the invasion is, is created in a way that we've seen also from other places in the world, namely Syria where they are terrorizing civilian population. They are, they are hitting civilian infrastructure, whether it be water, uh, electricity, heating. And they are constantly doing what is called a double tap, where they are, are bombing the same place over and over again, where people are trying to collect water or aid. And that brutality is extremely important to show that we have a war in 2022, 23, which has so significantly an impact on civilians. And for me, it's about trying to get as close to these people uh, as possible, um, to show them uh, as, as, as correctly as it was actually seen and experienced. So, so that is a very, very important part uh, of it for me. There's a picture here of a, of a woman who uh, recognizes her son in a morgue. Uh, he was a school student. She hadn't heard from him for 10 days. And uh, we were walking through uh, old garages because the morgue was completely full of, of bodies. And we were walking through all these dead bodies in plastic bags, opening them. And at one point, she opens a plastic bag and recognizes her son. And of course, she breaks completely down into tears and desperation. Uh, and then it, it actually changes. And she, she, uh, she was crying at my shoulder. And then afterwards, she got angry and mad. And she said, you have to show these pictures to the world show them what they are doing to our school students. Uh, and that's the kind of intimacy and closeness with the people that I meet, I want to, 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 to show here. I've been covering wars and conflicts for the last 35 years, and I've covered just about any conflict that you can e imagine. And for me, one of the things which, which really had a, a significant impact on me, both in terms of the work and the brutality, was the, the genocide in Rwanda in 94. In, in many ways, that brutality is second to none. But this comes I mean, the war in Ukraine comes really, really close because it's, it, it's basically a country which is desiring democracy and freedom uh, and independence. And because of that, they are killed. And the fact that, that nobody is spared uh, within this conflict. I mean, you take a city like Kharkiv, the, the second largest city in the country, you have massive areas uh, which is completely flattened. And the life that was lived there were a life just like you and me. It, it was exactly the same uh, perception of life that they wanted. They took their kids to school or to kindergarten and they played football with their children uh, when they came back home from school. 
and now it's completely flattened and it looks like Dresden uh, during the, the Second World War. And even worse on the front lines, because on the front lines in Donbass, for instance, it, it, it looks like World War I with all these trenches. These trenches is like a spider web uh, going through the entire area with thousands of casualties, uh, dead soldiers, uh, civilians who are being evacuated if they can, or even worse, uh, places where the civilians are living in basements also with their children, and, and they actually have a name for it. Uh, the, the frontline soldiers, they call them cellar ghosts uh, because they are so pale and, and they have been living in these basements for, for months and months and have nowhere to go. I think that the silence in, 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 in the work is actually something that, that comes to my mind whenever I'm there. <clears throat> it's also, you have to remember that you, Ukrainian are, uh, Ukrainians are extremely resilient uh, people. There is a very uh, uh, famous saying in Ukrainian, which is that every dog is a lion in its own house. And that is, a, that is indeed true. So even though you are in these frontline areas and, and, and you have this strange silence within or in between the bombing, you will see people trying to go about on their daily life as nothing happened. I mean, there is a picture in the exhibit with a man uh, on his bike crossing a bridge which is completely bombed and, and the, the, the track was so narrow but it was a bridge and he had his bike and he needed to go somewhere. So the silence in, is in many ways also the result of the war. I mean you can talk to a lot of different war photographers or correspondents and we would all be afraid of something different. Some, some people don't like bombardments or sniper fire or street fighting. For me, it's always been silence. I hate when a place is silent because that, that you can be sure that something is about to happen. And, and for me, it's, it's also a thing that I combine in, in a lot of my pictures because it's, it's silence bef before something. The picture with, with the woman who was severely scarred. Her story is very personal. She was waiting uh, in line to get aid for her children, and then she was hit by fragments from a mortar shell. And looking at her, in her eyes and seeing the damages, which was not just in her face, but all over her body, um, I mean, she didn't know. I mean, she had no part in this. And that is also what I'm trying to show with some of these pictures, not just showing them as victims, but also showing them as people who really don't understand why this happened to them. Ukraine has, has found a special place in my heart. I, I love the Ukrainian people. I love the resilience. I love the, uh, their courage and, and their ability to, to try and, and keep a normal life going, even though there is a full-scale war right outside their front doors. Uh, and, and a lot of these people whom I've met uh, have impressed me tremendously in terms of both, uh, both their ability to, uh, to try and, and act as normal as possible, and at the same time uh, being as strong as they are. Uh, you have to remember that a lot of women and children has left the country, and that's created 
I mean, the amount of refugees out of the country has also created big problems internally in society. You have a lot of uh, men who are now on the front lines who miss their, their children and, and their wives. Or you have uh, women and children around the world who miss their husbands. And at the same time, they know that this is what has to be done in order to, 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 to fight for freedom. On a longer scale, there's something else which is going to be a huge problem, which is the traumas that, that a lot of these children grow up with. Uh, I've met a lot of children on the front lines. They are also in basements where they are listening to old cartoons on, on, on TVs with way too high sound so that they won't hear the bombings going on right outside the, the basements. But a lot of these children are already traumatized severely. And on, a, on, a, on the next level on this, it's going to be a huge problem uh, in the future in terms of helping them, trying to understand what happened. I mean, my big heroes uh, throughout history, people like Sebastio Salgado and and other photographers have always been working in black and white. And, and one of the things that, that I really like about black and white is the timelessness within the, in the frames. And that's something that I've been working on for a long time uh, in terms of all the stories that I'm doing that we think in our part of the world that the world has changed, we have developed, we have moved far away from, from, from what we have seen historically. But the fact is, we, it hasn't. So by shooting it in black and white, you create a timelessness where people will look at some of these images and say, this looks just like Second World War, or even worse, this looks like First World War. And, and having that connection with something that is happening today, hopefully will, have, will help people reflect upon not just the war and the brutality, but also about uh, humanity, that nothing changed. I mean, it's still the same uh, atrocities. It's still the same type of war which is being fought. It's still the same victims. Nothing in terms of that has changed. And um, one of the things I'm going to work on when I go back now is I'm going to shoot on my old wet plate cameras as well. Uh, because Roger Fenton, the first uh, war photographer in the world, he photographed the, crime, the war in Crimea all the way back s several hundred years ago. And, and the, the, most of these pictures were about the destruction of a society. I've been working on a big project called Warscapes, I mean, Landscapes in War. Uh, and that's where I'm going to do that again uh, as well. And, and again, to show even further how much it looks the same. These pictures are important because it is something that will change the world order, first of all. Second of all, we have an ability in, in, in many societies around the world to, to, to go into some kind of fatigue in, in terms of, of looking at what is going on. But we cannot forget this war because this is so defining in many ways. And that's what I want to highlight. I want to, to keep people uh, aware of just uh, how brutal this is. And that's also why I'm traveling back now. I'm going to go back for four or six weeks again now. I'm doing a book about the war. And it will not be a beautiful book. It will not be, it will not be a book full of uh, aesthetics and, and uh, all these things. It will be a very, very harsh book, but it's a documentation of the conflict. It's a, it's a clean sheet reportage documentation. And I hope uh, also future-wise that a lot of these pictures will be, be used once we, we get into a situation where we are talking of war tribunals and atrocities uh, 
against mankind uh, in terms of civilians being bombed, that some of these images can be used there as a documentation for these atrocities.